We have so much to thank Jesus for, amen? This morning, I have a message that um, is a delight to be able to preach. Because this message that I'm going to share with you today is the core of everything that we're here for. And um, this morning, we're going to be continuing in our series in the book of John, and we're going into John chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to turn to John chapter 3, or you can follow along with our overhead. We really don't know the day when we're going to transition from the physical state that we find ourselves in here to our eternal state of being. We don't know the day. I was just pondering this and how quickly life passes. And I know for those of you who are older than me, you would think, man, my life just seems like a snap of the fingers. And it's the snap of the fingers to me. And, and even if you're young, when you consider how long you've been here. It's just a snap of the fingers. You know, the average life expectancy of a person in Canada is 82.1 years. That's the latest stats. And this means that on the average, every person has a life expectancy of 29,966 and a half days. Now, I'm 55. And I have roughly 9,500 days, or maybe a little less or a little more, until I reach the average life expectancy. If you're 75 years old here today, you only have 2,500 days left. If you're over 80 here, you're right there on the line. <laughs> You see, from the, the, the time we're first born, the truth of the matter is we have very, very little time to invest. One moment we're living and breathing and going through our daily routines, and in a moment our physical body fades, and we're standing before God giving an account for the life that has been given to us. In today's message, I want to continue the dialogue that the Apostle John has laid out in his gospel in John chapter 3. Now concerning John chapter 3, Charles Spurgeon once said this, he said, if we were asked to read to a dying man who did not know the gospel, we should probably select this chapter as the most suitable one for such an occasion. And what is good for dying men is good for us all, for that is what we are. And how soon we may actually get at the gates of death, none of us can tell. So, starting with verse 1 and 2 of John chapter 3, we read, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So in the opening part of this chapter, we see this man named Nicodemus step forward. And it appears that Nicodemus was a searcher. See, not all Pharisees were completely against Jesus. Some Pharisees thought that the Lord Jesus was operating in the power of the devil when he did his miracles. But Nicodemus was different. He was drawn to Jesus. And having a, a great knowledge of the Hebrew Bible, and having seen the wonders that the Lord Jesus was performing, he concluded that Jesus must be a man who was sent from God. Now Nicodemus, he was an important man in his culture. 
He was a respected Pharisee, a knowledgeable teacher, and a member of the Sanhedrin court. He represented the very best of the nation. The Sanhedrin court had 70 members who were responsible for all the religious decisions and also to dispense civil law under the Roman government rule. And even though Nicodemus had been through formal training of the school of Pharisees, which was extremely intense training. And Jesus had no formal schooling. He still addresses Jesus here with a respectful gesture, calling him a rabbi, which in those days means meant respected teacher. See, originally Jewish scholarship was oral. So they passed on their traditions. They passed on their teachings orally from one generation to the next. And in Jesus' days, rabbis expounded and debated the law of Moses and the other scriptures found in the Hebrew Bible known as the Tanakh, without benefit of written works other than the Bible books themselves. So it was very important to the Jewish religious community to ensure that their leadership had the correct understanding of the scriptures. So um, they had to go through formal training. And part of the training process of Pharisees was that young boys would be taken with promise. They would be taken and they would be sent to a school under a rabbi. And here they would learn about the Old Testament law. They'd learn about the prophets. They'd learn about all of the Hebrew Bible, and they would actually start to memorize. Many boys, by the time they were 12, year, 12 years of age, had the first five books of the Old Testament memorized word for word. Can you imagine that? Especially when you read the Old Testament uh, Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. That's pretty tough business. This is how seriously they took it. So Jesus, however, was an enigma. He was the son of a carpenter. He had no formal training, so he was different than the rest of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. You see, when Jesus was 12, we are told in the scriptures of how his family went to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem when he was 12 years old. And, and on the way home, they, they usually traveled in a caravan. The whole family would go to the Passover celebrations for the week. And on the way home, they recognized, hey, where's Jesus? He's not with us. Where, where is he? So they turned around and they went back to Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 2, chapter, chapter 2, verses 45 to 49, we read this. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And Jesus looked at his parents. He says, Why were you searching for me? He asked, Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? See, Jesus was different than the other boys his age. Jesus Christ uh, was, was a, a different person compared to the average 12-year-old. You see, he didn't have a sin nature. So if you were going to be Mary and you wanted to raise a family, guess who the model child is in, is in your family? It's Jesus. He's the model child. He's the model son. He's the model person because he was born into the world without a sin nature. So, you see, the te like the teachers who were amazed at Jesus' understanding and his answers when he was a boy, Nicodemus, this high-ranking Pharisee, recognized something good in Jesus. Something was different about him that was drawing him. So he came under the cover of darkness to find out more. Now Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, I, th I think, and most scholars would agree with this, because he was likely afraid of being criticized by the other religious leaders 
who were angry at Jesus. And they, he came during the night to ask Jesus some inquisitive questions because he was really inwardly looking for answers. And Jesus, being who he is, immediately understands where Nicodemus is coming from. He understood that Nicodemus was asking deeper questions and that his heart was searching for answers. So he immediately spoke to the very core of the issue that Nicodemus had. So Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Well, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Nicodemus knew the physical impossibility of what Jesus was saying, so he provided a rhetorical question to Jesus, a suggestion to try and get Jesus to explain what he meant. And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So Jesus lays out a spiritual truth to Nicodemus. You see, the truth is that a person is made up of more parts than just his physical and soul being. When God created man, he created humanity with a living soul. In Genesis 2, 7, we read the scriptures, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And in the King James Version, it says, And the man became a living soul. Now, soul life has with it a mind to think and a will to do and emotions to feel. The realm of the soul is the realm of animal life that is resident in the other creatures of the earth who think, will, and feel. It is often associated with our personality and our identity. It is our very person, and it expresses who we are in the fabric of of our personality as a framework. But God made mankind distinctively different than the animal kingdom. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. What the Bible refers to as the image of God or a magio deo is not his ability to reason, to make decisions, or to have feelings. It is not our soul that makes us in the image of God. What a magio deo refers to is the fact that God created and place within man a spirit. Our spirit is the innermost, deepest part of our being that enables us to intuitively substantiate the spiritual realm and to have a relationship with God. And in his suggestion to Nicodemus, Jesus explains that a person can be physically born into this world, be intact in their mind, their will, and their emotions. They have a soul, yet be spiritually dead. Nicodemus would have been aware of the story in Genesis of the fall of humanity into disobedience. See, before Eve was even created, Adam was with God in the garden. Genesis 2, 15 to 17 said, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And most of us know the story of how Eve was tempted and, and ate the fruit that she wasn't supposed to eat. And then she gave some to Adam, who also ate it in disobedience to the command of the Lord. They were, they were, they were tricked by Satan, the serpent. He, they were tricked by him, and, and, and they ate of the fruit. And, and what happened after Adam and Eve, and Eve disobeyed God was that man was sentenced to death. We talked about this in communion. You see, death is separation. Death in the physical realm came to humanity after the fall. Physical death means separation of the soul and body and the severing of that from, from a person, right? You're severed. It's severed. When you physically die, your body is severed from your spirit. Spiritual death also came with the fall. Now, physical death, when Adam um, sinned and Eve sinned, didn't come immediately. It came later, but it came. But spiritual death, which is of greater significance than physical death, is the separation of man's spirit from God. Spiritual death occurred immediately upon the decision of Adam and Eve to disobey the Lord. In Genesis 3, it were told, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You see, when sin enters into the picture, there is separation and relationship with God, and the wicked heart needs to hide from God. Because of sin, the fellowship of the close relationship that Adam and Eve had with God in the beginning was broken. They were spiritually separated from God by their sins. They died in spirit in their relationship to God. And this was passed down through all generations of people to us today. And we call this the sin nature. Romans 5.12 puts it this way. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. And because sin polluted the relationship that humanity had with God, mankind without a Savior is lost, is spiritually dead, bound as a slave to their sin nature. And this is why Jesus said that what is spiritually dead in people needs to come back to life before they will see the kingdom of God. To illustrate his thoughts on this, Jesus continues his explanation by telling Nicodemus a small parable. And in verse 8, he says this. He says to Nicodemus, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So in this parable, Jesus illustrates the impact of the Holy Spirit in bringing people from spiritual death to spiritual life. See, the wind in the natural sense, okay? It moves the branches of the trees and it rustles the grass. It can be felt blowing against our face, yet it is invisible. Nobody can control or manipulate the winds and their unique movements as they go across the face of the earth. And Jesus infers that by a process as unseen as the process of the wind, the Holy Spirit works upon the human spirit to accomplish God's purposes. And little by little, perhaps even unconsciously, to the receiver of the, of the Spirit's influence, God chips away at indifferences and hostilities towards him. The Holy Spirit leaves impressions on a person like gusts of wind that draw that individual to understand how lost they are without a Savior. 
And then seemingly all at once, the Holy Spirit impacts that person with a compulsion, a magnet, magnetic compulsion to surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the conversion results in that person suddenly becoming alive in their spirit, where they're dead before. They come alive in their spirit. And it seems very sudden, but in reality, it is the result of a series of calculated, methodical, and patient processes that were long before initiated by God to bring the person to that point. And everyone is unique. And God speaks to everyone individually. Well, how can this be? Nicodemus asked. Jesus said, You're, You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. See, in reality, with all his studies in the Hebrew Bible, Nicodemus ought to have known what Jesus was talking about. He ought to have known it. In the prophets in the Old Testament, there are prophecies speaking of the messianic age that would come where God would move upon his people by the power of the Holy Spirit. Consider what the prophet Ezekiel predicted would come to Israel in Ezekiel chapter 36, 25 to 27, which reads, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The Spirit would move into a person to change them. That's what this is talking about. This is the prophecy. Or in, for, for, for example, in, in Joel, we see in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, the prophet Joel predicted what would happen. And afterwards, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, speaking of a day to come. But Nicodemus, Nicodemus was ignorant of what Jesus was speaking about. In reality, Nicodemus actually represented the, the nation's unbelief and their lack of knowledge. See, when it comes to the sinful human heart, and this is true today in the same way it was true in the day of Nicodemus. You see, not everybody wishes to be reborn. A person in this state will purposely shut their eyes and minds and will deliberately misunderstand what spiritual rebirth means when Jesus comes with an offer to change and recreate us, we will reject the power that could bring that change into a reality. How many people have rejected the Lord Jesus saying, no, thank you. No, thank you. I'm happy with things the way that they are. I don't want to be changed. It breaks God's heart. You see, for the person who does not want to be changed, they will claim that because they don't totally understand how it works, what God offers can't be a reality because I don't totally get this. I don't understand it totally on how it works on every level. But consider the things that that person will embrace without knowing really how they work. Most of us haven't got the foggiest clue of how our cell phones or GPSs or computers actually work down to the minute detail. Yeah, maybe there's the odd person that's a rocket scientist or, or something or a computer genius. Okay, But for the most part, we don't know how these things actually work, yet we can't deny that these 
devices that have been created, how they can help us and how we can make them work for us. You see, our, our lack of understanding doesn't prevent us from experiencing the benefit of these devices. In the same way, we may not understand exactly how the Holy Spirit works in our hearts. But the effects of the Holy Spirit's work in us are there for everyone to see. And as Christians who have had the breath of the Holy Spirit breathed into us when our sins were forgiven by Jesus, right? our lives are different now. There should be a difference. And when people look at us, they should see the work of God that's taken place in us, even if they don't understand it. And even if I don't even understand exactly how God did it to me. All I know is that I have been changed. I was blind, but now I see. You see, Jesus tells Nicodemus in verse 12, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? You see, Nicodemus was a religious leader, and he was having a hard time understanding and believing the basic things of what Jesus was teaching here. Nicodemus illustrates our inability, the inability of our natural mind to comprehend the truth of God on our own. You see, without the enlightening of the Holy Spirit, to distinguish divine truths, we, we can't understand it. We can't understand it. See, it's easy for people to be seekers, to sit down in discussion groups and study and read books and talk about the intellectual truth of religion or what they consider not to be. It's easy. But to understand the essentials of what the Lord has expressed through His Word regarding salvation, our eyes must be supernaturally open to the truth of Jesus' words and their application to us, or like Nicodemus, we'll be lost in our own thinking. And we won't be able to comprehend it because it is spiritually discerned. And when our spirits are dead, we cannot discern. But then when our spirits are brought back to life, all of a sudden the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, reveals what His Word means. And that's why as Christians and as a a believer, I can say, Lord, thank You for the revelation of Your Word to me. I was blind, but now I see. I open the Word and it becomes alive. And the, and the things that the Lord teaches jump off the page and penetrate my being. And I'm like, wow! It's like discovering gemstones in a, in a mine. And the, and the walls are just lined with these gemstones. But without the miner's light, all you're doing is groping around in the dark, feeling the walls, and it, you don't understand it. You can't comprehend it because what is, what is there in treasure is spiritually discerned, and you will never be able to discern the Word of God on your own. You need the Spirit's illumination. You need the light of God to illuminate it so that you can see. <sighs> Nicodemus. Hmm. Nicodemus was a seeker, but he needed his eyes opened. You see, this is why the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 14, these things are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What, do we ha- what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, listen to this, but considers them foolishness. And they cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. We must come to the point where our supernatural eyes are opened 
to see that we are sinners, to see that we're hopelessly bound to sin with no escape on our own. We must come to the point where we see that Jesus is God in the flesh and that he and he alone is the only remedy for our state of brokenness. We must come to the point where we are willing to humble our pride before the living God and ask him to give us his amazing and saving grace. And then and only then will we experience life-changing power of true Christianity in all that it was meant to be through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit who regenerates us and gives us new spiritual life. So many people say, i got to get things together before I can become a Christian. No, come to God just as you are, and he'll take the mess that you are, and he'll straighten you out. He'll teach you a new way. He'll open your eyes. He'll show you the path to life. So don't wait. Don't try and figure it out. You're not going to be able to figure it out on your own. But when you have faith, and you have the faith of a little child, and you trust the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, And you give God who you are and say, God, take everything I am, everything I have. God will reveal his fullness to you. He will reveal his fullness to you and you will be changed. You will be born again. And this is what Jesus was trying to explain to Nicodemus. He says in verse 13, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Well, maybe if you haven't read the Old Old Testament stories here, this is kind of a mystery to you, because maybe that's the first time you've heard this before. But for Nicodemus, he was a student of the Hebrew Bible. He knew that one day the Messiah would come up and set up a literal kingdom on the earth. But what he didn't understand was the manner in, in which he would do this. In order for a person to enter the kingdom of heaven person must have new birth within their spirit. The spiritual eyes of humanity are deadened by sin. They're dead by sin. They need to be raised to life. And Jesus here is speaking to the fact that only the only man who is actually qualified to explain how earthly truths concerning the coming Messiah would be translated into the understanding of of truths of God's heavenly plan was the Son of Man. Son of Man. Jesus explains the conditions of the world are like the conditions that the Israelites faced while traveling through the desert on their way to the Promised Land. Although God miraculously set Israel free from their slavery in Egypt, and brought them into the desert. And he miraculously provided them with spirit, with bread to eat, manna from heaven, and water to drink. Although he took care of them on every corner, on every side, they complained. And they cursed God for, for his provision because their lives were not comfortable the way they thought they should be comfortable. So they cursed the Lord. And because of this, because they refused to thank God, their futile hearts were darkened. They refused to thank God. Does it sound familiar? Romans 1? Their foolish hearts were darkened. And because of this, a plague of serpents, poisonous snakes, was set upon them. And these poisonous snakes bit the people. And many of them died and were ill. And, they, and the reason why this happened was because they cursed God for all the goodness that he had done and despite all the goodness he had done for them and in them and, and he'd given them the breath of life. They cursed them. And they cursed God and they were bitten by snakes. And they were filled with a snake's poison. And they, when they came to their desperation before their dying breath, they cried out. They cried out to God to save them. In the book of Numbers 21, 7 and 9 we read, the people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. 
Pray that the Lord will take these snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. And this is what Jesus was talking to with Nicodemus. You see, sin, like an infestation of poisonous vipers in a great dry desert has doomed humanity to death. And Jesus explained to Nicodemus that the Savior of the world, the heavenly Messiah that he was seeking, needed to come down from heaven and be born as a human being. He needed to be the Son of Man, but he needed to come from heaven. You see, he needed to be the Son of Man to be the representation of man before God. And when he came, the truth was that rather than what Nicodemus thought should happen, the truth was that the Savior must be lifted up like the bronze snake on the pole which saved the Israelites during their exodus from slavery in Egypt. See, there's an old song where the people used to sing, lift Jesus higher, lift him up for the world to see. He said, if I'd be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. That's not taking Jesus with a banner and going, lift him up higher, lift him up. Raise the voice and lift him up higher. No, that prophecy is talking about Jesus being lifted up on the cross and sacrificed for our sins. Jesus Christ is the snake on the pole. See, he's the one that took the price of sin, which represents the, the snake. He took that upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be called the righteousness of God. He was lifted up from the earth so that men would be drawn unto him. See, at this point, it's true what God wrote through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 21. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the, in, its, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who would believe. See, this is the point where Jesus speaks the truth of the gospel to Nicodemus because he was referring to himself as the one who would be lifted up from the earth to draw all men unto him. And he says this in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, you see. The poisonous bite of the viper is nullified. That person is healed by his stripes. We are healed. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they did not believe in the name of God's one and only Son. Oh, in this famous passage of Scripture, Jesus reveals that whosoever would look to the Messiah and believe in him, that person will receive eternal life by being born again in their spirits in exchange for the eternal death that was resident in them because of their sin nature. Just as the Israelites who were dying from the bite of the snake looked at the bronze snake on the pole, the person who looks at the Messiah as their Savior will be rescued from the serpent's bite and the consequences of their sin. You see, Jesus is God's revealed Messiah. He didn't come to this world to condemn. He came to save. He came to save people from the death penalty of sin. He took it so seriously. The creator of the universe took it so seriously that he took the penalty that we deserved upon himself so that when he died, he died in our stead. So the wrath of God was poured out upon himself rather than upon us. This is the love of God and that's why we can say John 3.16 is 
the core of the gospel, because of love, God gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins in exchange for wrath and condemnation, in exchange for eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. Jesus came to bring us out of the miry pit, to bring us out of death and into life. This is the good news of the gospel. And without the gospel, no one should be saved. The whole world is in the clutches of sin. And you and my responsibility as believers is to share with other people the goodness of what God has done in us. Amen? There's family, there's friends, there's people maybe even here today who've never heard this explained. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day where you can uh, be snatched from damnation and punishment and be brought into life. And God is good, and he will save you. This is the message that needs to be preached to the rest of the world. Because no, you're not good enough on your own. You're not going to please God enough on your own. There's not enough in you because he's holy. And he requires perfection because of his holiness. That's why you need a perfect exchange from a perfect Savior who will take your sin upon his shoulders and will take your sin and wash it away so that when God looks at you, he no longer sees a sinner. He sees a saint who is cleansed by his own work. This is what it means to say that God is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is before all things. He is in all things, and he works through all things. He, you see, he is the sacrifice. He is the Lord God. He's the gate. He's the high priest. He's the one who rescues us. Because he is good. This is the verdict, John says. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. There's a light that's going forth from this passage of Scripture this morning. A light into the darkness. And if you are living in a state of darkness right now, you need to come into the light because you're not going to know spiritual reality of a relationship with God unless you do. Unless you accept Jesus as your substitution as your sacrifice, as your Passover lamb, the wrath of God will come down upon you in the end. And God desires that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance means changing the direction that you're going and turning around and going in a new direction. God wants you to leave your life of sin, turn to him and say, Lord, take my sin upon your shoulders. Cleanse me and help me to walk in a way that pleases you and God supernaturally. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in. He takes your sin and casts it as far as the east is from the west, paid for the by the blood of Christ, and then he enters into you and becomes your God at one with you. The temple is no longer out there. The temple is in the hearts of people who are surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this can happen for you today if you give your life to Jesus. If you surrender your life to him, it's more than just a prayer. It is a commitment to leave the past behind and to come to him recognizing that you're broken and you can't save yourself. And when you do that, my friend, new life will begin. You'll be born again in the Spirit, raised to life. And what was undiscernible for you before will now become discernible because God will reveal it. Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning? Jesus, we thank you for your love for us, Lord. We thank you for salvation that was given. We thank you for the story of Nicodemus, Lord. 
Lord, we ask that, Father, if we know you, Lord, that you would just remind us of who you are and remind us of the grace that's been given to us by your goodness. Lord, if there's someone here today that never has given their heart to you, their spirit to you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. I pray if you're here today and you don't know the Lord or if you're listening online and you don't know the Lord, you can know him. It just means that you need to be willing to lay your life down to him. Be willing to come to him and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need your grace. I, I, I look to you, Lord, and I realize that you're my savior and I want to live for you. I want to leave my old life behind and I want to walk in newness of life. Would you bring me alive in my spirit, Lord? Would you make me born again? Would you take the old and wash it and put your heart within mine? Spirit of the living God, take away my sin and come and live with me. Live in me, Lord. Live through me, Lord. I offer my life a living sacrifice to you, Lord. I give you my life because it belongs to you. You're the one that gave it to me and I'm just giving you what you already own. I'm surrendering it, Lord. If you prayed that prayer this morning, and you ask the Lord sincerely from your heart to cleanse you from your sin, and you're willing to walk away from the way you used to live, if you believe, you will be saved. And today is the day of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.